So first you got to accept that you're, you're part of the thing that is lifting the art into the next generation. And then what is going to be your contribution to that? You consider your role in the evolution of the martial arts and what will be your contribution, your sustained contribution. And because if that doesn't happen, I believe there is no evolution. Welcome to our podcast. Today we have a special treat as I sit down and talk with Shihan Jean Dunn. Shihan Dunn is a lifelong martial arts practitioner, beginning his martial arts training in Shotokan Karate at the age of 11 and achieving the rank of black belt under Toyotoro Miyazaki. He is also a black belt in Judo under Kyoshi Shina and in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu under Henzo Gracie. During our conversation, we discuss how in his youth he competed worldwide at the highest level. However, now dedicates his life to the spread of traditional martial arts through safe, effective, and non-competitive methods. We also discuss the importance of martial legacy and instilling core life values in our students through our martial arts instruction and practice. Anyone who has ever trained with Shihan Jin Dunn knows firsthand how effective his teaching methods are and how insightful a conversation with him can be. I personally gained a myriad of knowledge from our talk, and I hope you do too. Please enjoy Shihan Jin Dunn. Shihan, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure, pleasure to chat with you like thank this. You. Um, I think we'll start with just how did you get started in the martial arts? Um, well, my, I went to live with my brother, David, uh, in Chicago when I was 12. I was having a very difficult year. Um, my dad had passed that year and I was, you know, not processing things very well and I got in trouble in school and, uh, my, I went to live with my brother in Chicago and he was, a he was doing a, he's a scientist, he was doing a fellowship at a place called Bell Labs. Right. And Bell Labs, there were a few scientists that were black belts there, and they had like a little dojo in a, um, uh, an, like an unused house slash room at the end of the, kind of the far end of the property of the laboratory. And we would go there three times a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Saturday, and and it was a Shotokan Karate Dojo, and uh, and that's where I started. There were there was one, two black belts, one brown belt, two green belts. One of my brother was my brother was one of those green belts, mm -hmm. and me. Yeah, it was a twelve-year-old white belt. Yeah, nice tight knit group. It was. It, it it was it was really rigorous and really very, very good for me. Mm. Being a 12 year old boy from like, grew up in New York City, like kind of on the streets, uh, in trouble, like that rigor, that focus, that discipline, that, that those men were really, really instrumental for me. I got to see something that I never saw before in, in them through their karate. So you kind of set up positive role models to guide you on your journey through that too. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And they, but they were, they were more like lighthouses to me. They felt like very individual. And I knew that I wasn't going to stay in Chicago. Like it, they, these were not going to be, although I was going to continue karate, these were not going to be like permanent role models for me. They were like beacons for me, and they still remain that way for me. They're like very solid, very sturdy, and in some ways, like very much the light of my life because karate has been the constant. So as you were growing up and you had that karate as that constant force in your life, how did it, how did it help you grow? How did, it, how did it help you through those troubling times as you developed into a young man? Yeah, well, um, this is just such an interesting question. You know, moving back to New York, I kind of fell back in with, uh, with, the, with the social group mm -hmm. and, and running the streets and doing stuff like that. So it wasn't like, it, 
it wasn't like the light turned on and then it was easy sailing. It was con like all of those things were being challenged and and you know I was I was not managing well. I was managing well. It was so so. It wasn't until I went to study with Mr. Miyazaki that I I started to have those constant role models. Mm. And I, I started to see what, like, a lifetime of practice did and with, with people that I could see were very successful. So that started to okay, formulate some decisions for me. I started to make better decisions because I wanted to be good in karate. I wanted to, to have the respect of my peers and my seniors and certainly my teacher. And so I started to kind of let go of, of, of the bad behavior, I guess yeah. is a way to put it, you know, or the, the, the undisciplined sloppiness in my thinking and my behavior. Uh, and, you know, it took a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still working on it, really. I'm still working yeah. on it. About how long into training do you think that it finally started to click? To that that's the path you wanted to go on? You know, I remember being like 18 or 19 mm. and deciding that I wanted to... Uh, it's a, it's, it's, the, a couple of things happened right at that point. One is I, I got fired from my last job Mm -hmm. And I went to I, I went to ask my sensei. I said I don't like I don't have a job. May I just come to the dojo and spend my time here? I can clean. I can help teach. I can do whatever. You don't need to pay me. Like not that I was independently wealthy. I was broke, but uh, I didn't want him to think that he had to carry me. I, I tried to take a, 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 an authentic apprentice role. And I don't know how I got that, by the way. I, that we ne I, I didn't grow up in that. Right. No one in my house ever talked about being an apprentice. But I just kind of intuited it. Maybe it was a divine message. And at that same time, I was thinking like, <clears throat> I wanted to be really good. And in those days, I was very fearful of physical f confrontation. Um, and so I wanted to overcome that, so I decided to start competing. And I ended up being the US on the US team, the captain of the US karate team for some events, and traveling the world, going to the world championships. And so those that decision to, to help out at the dojo and to start working on my fear as it related to conflict and, you know, really with other men, like, um, happened kind of simultaneously. Maybe they were six months apart, but right around 18 or 19. Okay. I can, I can really appreciate that. Um, I also, when I was younger, lost my mom when I was eight. And when I started training with Mr. Dirk and as a young kid for a little bit, came back as a teenager, I also kind of fell into that position where I knew this was a place I wanted to be. You know, Mr. Dirk and Marcus Trainer, all the other role models there for me, I was falling into it the same way. Like yeah. every day I was just at the dojo and one yeah. day one of my best friends was going off to school and Mark's like, what do you want to teach your class? Like, it should be Bill uh -huh. and you should pay him. And I'm like, oh, Whoa. I could teach karate for a living. Like, this is what I could do. Yeah, man, like, I think for, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, be a little bit liberal with my my thought here and you could correct me if I'm wrong but for kids like us mm -hmm. who experienced some things that were probably difficult like the dojo is such an amazing and safe environment yes I'm not saying everybody out there is amazing and safe though with the right sensei yeah with the right person and certainly mr. Miyazaki and mr. Durkin were right people um, it was, it's such a blessing. It was like, to, it, you know, as an aside, P 
people ask if my friends ask, are you, are you watching Cobra Kai? And I'm like, no, I'm not watching Cobra Kai. Why? It's so great. And it's like, because the Karate Kid was so important to me. Mm. I don't want a variant. I just don't. Like, that movie, that situation, that storyline, that, like, it was me. It was me. And, and I don't really want any. And so what I'm saying, like, is that just karate for the right people. And I think it's for everybody, but for people like us, it was such a... A saving grace, yeah. if you will. It becomes your second family. Yeah, so, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, and third and fourth family, too. <laughs> they all kind of intertwine yeah, at some yeah. point. Yeah, my opinion. Yeah, I think all my friends, most of my friends are from the dojo or from people from the dojo. My wife was introduced to me by one of my friends from the dojo, so it all just falls together. Oh, man, I know. What a great, like, center point. Yeah. So, so you said you trained at, I mean, so you competed at a very high level, <clears throat> and from the early days of competition to now, how have you kind of evolved with your training? Well, first of all, I, I had to come to terms with the fact that I was looking for something external, a medal, to validate me and my, my practice, myself. <coughs> so I had to come to terms with that. Mm -hmm. I had to, to reevaluate. Um, and I loved karate, and I, I think I intuited to some degree that if all I was was a competitor, that when that stopped, then my, my karate training, my life as a karateka would, I mean, stop. You know, it doesn't, it's not a, a, a stretch. So I started to reevaluate what it was that I was doing it for. And You know, I asked Mr. Miyazaki, like, I, 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 I had such a, 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 an appetite for karate. And I said, you know, who are the best, like, martial artists for you? And who are the people that stay the longest? I said that to him. I think it must have been 18, mm -hmm. 19. And he said, the people that competed tend to stay in it the longest. And it didn't make sense to me then, but it certainly makes sense to me now. And this is how I'm gonna answer your question, is that what competition gave me is a way to view my training with a fever. I train three times a day, and I've done that since I'm 18 years old. And I don't miss, I don't miss. There's some, like, there are variants, sometimes it's, you know, resistance training. Right. Other times it's jujitsu training. Other times it's kickboxing training. But I've kept that schedule. You have that physicality at least three times a day. Uh, something. I'm doing right. something to kind of improve my my understanding, my ability, what all, all of it. And so in that way, competition or that part of my experience informed the rest of my practice. And what I had to learn in that is that the mentality of like, you know, do or die, like that had to be adjusted. You know, like I have to win, 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 win at all right. costs. Um, that had to be adjusted, refined, some things let go. I had to look deep, look in the mirror and, and like ask myself, well, why do, why am I why am I so rough? Or what, or what am I trying to prove? All of those things, which I think are important questions to ask as we mature through the practice. My opinion. My humble, not so humble opinion. Um, so in that way, I think that's how it changed. I, 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 I still have this fever, if you will, for the practice. Mm -hmm. And it's tempered by a continual questioning of my motives. And that's, I think, the, the genesis of how the, the, if I heard your question correctly, how the, the training for me has changed or evolved right. from one to the other. It's really cool to hear that introspection because some people just train to train but don't really think about why. And you saying like, 
why am I doing this when you're in that competition mindset versus where you are now? That's, I think that's really important. I think that's really cool. Thank you. I, I, I mean, I, I have trained just to train. Like I have nothing, trained to get like a workout in. Yeah. But it's like eating chocolate cake. It's like, yeah, it's cool. It's good. Mm -hmm. But like, where's the sustenance in that? Where's the benefit? Like, and so, I, I don't know, like, I think you and I were talking earlier when you were helping me with the kata about <clears throat> the, the, like, the lineage of Weichiru. And we were discussing the kind of hard and soft nature. And I, I it's, I had said, like, I encourage students to look at the, what the founding fathers had to say about this whole practice. Mm. What were they after? What did they think about as their motivators, as what they wanted to achieve? And I, I don't know, I, I can't recall any piece of literature that I've ever re read from any of the founding masters where they say, just go work out, just do it to do it. Right. I, I don't, I don't, maybe there is, but I don't ever recall that. Wouldn't it make a good book? Probably, probably, that's, a, that's an important <laughs> point. And, but so I, 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 I try to take that to heart. Like I try to, and may I encourage other karateka to take it to heart. It kind of ties into my next question. Uh, so, all that being said, like, what to you is the way of karate? What, what to you is the budo of it? And if that's the word, right word to use. Um, yeah, I, I mean, wow, what a word. And no one's ever asked me that question. So what am I present to? Like, oh, Bill thinks, like, he, he knows me or he has this idea of me as a buddhaka mm. or someone like a martial arts, like, like, I tell, I, this is a funny story, like, I, I, I spent a lot of time around Japanese masters, right? mm -hmm. I was blessed. Right. But like, the Japanese, the, the older Japanese karateka, like they have a swagger to them, they walk with their tandi and their, their, their belly forward and they sway a little bit. And I used to make fun of them when I was a kid, like, you know, like, just ridicule, like, adolescent stuff, you know? But now I do that. <laughs> now, you know, now I kind of like walk like I'm, you know, like my hips hurt and my belly's big. Um, I'm being very playful. Yes, of um, course. But the kind of like, now, oh, now I'm at that stage where like people are asking me questions about being in the martial arts. What is Buddha? And so thank you for that. Uh, you know, thank you. I'm present to that. Um, it's a big question. Yes. And, and I think that like, it's, it's a moving answer. It, what's, true, what I'm, what's true today may not be true for me tomorrow. And I hope that I'm, I can still practice in a way that I can discover more and deeper truths about it. Um, I'll answer it like this. Uh, my mom, Josephine, is a very interesting person, but has a, had had a very tough life. I did a podcast with her, and her first husband shot her, and she saves her own life. And 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 at growing up, I, I I asked her, and this is what I think karate is, and maybe because it's imprinted on me, I don't know, but it works for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I say, Mom, how did you do that? How did, you know, you, you, she walked down to the street, she hailed down a car in the mid-1960s in the deep south, and she sees her own life, and she says, I kept putting one foot in front of the other. I kept putting one foot in front of the other. And I think that that is an answer, a paradigm, 
that works very well for me as it relates to karate training. Because I think that the assumption is that we practice for our lives. And in the, our arc of experience, we're going to come up with many, many, many different challenges. Mm. Physical challenges, relationship challenges, financial challenges, and all through the lens of karate. And that lens, I believe, insists that we keep moving forward. That you, we never give up. You know, it's, oh, it's, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to, to, to take a shot or hit the deck or, or whatever. But we got to get back up and we got to keep fighting and we got to keep going and we got to keep improving and we got to keep... And I believe, you know, I had the privilege of seeing Mr. Durkin downstairs today, like one of my favorite people in the whole world. I agree. Martial arts people person in general, his wife, Judy, and he's putting one foot in front of the other and he's showing us and it's, it's beautiful and it's courageous and it's somewhat uncomfortable, I can imagine, and all these things and oh my gosh, what respect I have. And it's very much like that thing that Josephine had, or has, she still has it, is I just, you just keep putting one foot in front of the other. I hope that wasn't too long-winded for the no, answer. of course. And like you said, it's, <laughs> it's such a fluctuating answer, and you talk to one person at one moment, and it's going to be different from another person at another moment. But I do like how you connect that perseverance, because part of the training is at least the way that we teach it at my dojo, especially talking to the kids, is to learn that perseverance because life isn't always going to be easy, like you said, one way or another, whether it's physical, real life, having to finish up, or the mental aspect of it, which honestly, for the majority of us, it's going to be more of that, dealing with people, dealing with yourself, dealing with life challenges. And how do you take that perseverance from your training on the dojo floor, tough training, tough to, training. to life? And that's huge. Yeah, man, like, you know, I, I'm ashamed of this, but I'll share it. Like, I remember I, 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 wa I wasn't good at kata for two reasons. I wasn't able to focus, so I took, I shortcutted it. I'm not saying other people do, do what I did, but this was my track. And then I excused it away and said, I want to be a fighter. Mm. And I robbed myself of something really important that I had to come back to. And I believe that the kata is essentially an immovable object that insists on us kind of wrapping ourselves around. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we got to make adjustments because of our f perceived physical limitations, our age or whatever was going on in our life. But it is, it is a constant. And keep to move ourselves around that thing with perseverance. And, and it, it, it gives us so much to work with and to work against and to work for. And it's so important. So, so important. Like, I don't trash our, the next generation. I, I'm not... I'm not one of these old white guys that think that the past was better than the future. I just don't. Though I do think that there are important elements to keep that work. And one thing that certainly works is karate. Mm. And inside of that umbrella, what really works is the kata as it relates to a, a, a measuring stick. A, okay, where am I at with this today? And I took the shortcut out, like I, I you know, I, and I regret it. Was I gonna be the world champion in Kata? No way, it didn't mean anything. Right. The most important lessons were there for me to learn and I avoided them for the longest. 
don't avoid the lessons. <laughs> <laughs> don't avoid your kata. It's funny, I was kind of the opposite. I was afraid of getting hurt sparring. So yeah. I was like kata, kata, kata. Yeah. And then through some of the seniors at Mr. Durkin's school, especially, uh, I don't know if you've had the pleasure of working with David Kelly, but he was one of the ones who took me under his wing to learn to spar. Um, and I don't consider myself a good fighter one bit, but I do consider myself like someone who really now loves sparring. When you have someone you can play with, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's just a fun thing to mess around yeah, play. Sure. And now I'm taking the kata and try to really make sure my sparring as much as possible applies to that. And it's so cool to see that now playing with it, the connectivity between the two, because the kata should represent fighting if that's what you'd like it to represent and be able to apply that to what you do. Just watching uh, you teach your seminar showing us the jujitsu movements. I'm looking like there's a little bit of weichi kata right there. Yeah, yeah. And then I try to take that now to my sparring whenever I can. You know, um, a, a couple of things. Like, I was just talking to my friend yesterday on the way up. Uh, one of the best martial artists I know. And he he was saying that, like, karate and and martial arts has this embedded gem. And there's a phrase, F around and find out. Right? Like, I, we're... We're toning it down a bit, but I right. think everybody understands. Like, and I heard you say you get to fool around. Like that is the essence, man. Like you get to f around and find out. We get to toil, or we get to think and tinker and 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 find out. Find out what works. Find out what doesn't work. Find out if we're capable of more. If we are nervous about something like confrontation, which I definitely was. I still am. For sure, I get it. Uh, uh, and we get to find out. We go, oh, oh, can I get a little better here? Can I face my fear there? Can I mm -hmm. improve? Yep. It's so good. What's better than building your confidence and someone punching you in the face? <laughs> politely. I mean, yeah, I guess. Polite, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you know, know, and knowing you can deal with it. The other thing is, like, I love that, like, embedded in your story was your senpai relationship. You had a good senpai. You had a good big brother to kind of help you along there. Another important aspect of being in the dojo, a good Japanese dojo mm -hmm. or a good martial art dojo, is the senpai kohai relationship. It's fostered. I don't think that happens in a gym or necessarily an academy. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I've, been, I've spent several years in both of those environments. And I've never really witnessed a lot of it, you know. So it's great to have a, a senpai to go, Bill, come here. Let me show you a couple of things. Right. Let me help you deal with this. You can do it. That kind of leads into what my next question was going to be. So you train and teach karate, Shotokan karate. Yes. In Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yes. And my understanding is that there might be some crossing of philosophies. I mean, there might not be some crossing of philosophies. So... Do you find that people are training those for different reasons? you find the environment and the atmosphere in those kind of facilities is different? And as you as a teacher of both these, these practices, how do you kind of combine your own martial art philosophy into your teaching? You know, I believe it's my experience. And if any jujitsu people are out there watching, you can call me up and challenge me on it. But it was... Our school, my dojo, my jujitsu program that instituted a warm up, that instituted the bow, even though jujitsu people do it terribly, um, in instituted a, a, a standard uniform for a, an organization, um, introduced a standardized belt promotion. Jiu-Jitsu didn't have that before. I, I did it. We did it. And I'm not saying that to tout right. my own accolades or accomplishments. I'm saying that because I learned the importance of those things through my karate training. And I saw inherently that Jiu-Jitsu culture <clears throat> was not sustainable for a practitioner beyond a certain point. Mm -hmm. And um, and 
I don't know if you ever brought your wife to the dojo, but I know for sure if you did that you would feel that this was a safe environment for her. 100%. And that's not like that in a lot of like, I would never have brought my girlfriend or wife to Gleason's gym, to the boxing capital. It's, that thing was like the, the yard at Rikers Island. I saw people there getting high. I saw people there getting in fistfights. I saw people dealing, all kinds of stuff was happening. And I certainly never felt comfortable bringing my girlfriend or wife to the Jiu-Jitsu Academy. It, it, it's just a different vibe, a different thing. Right. And in those days. Things, and, things are changing. Well, well I, I hope they are. And I think that people, because in, in our culture, we're starting, people are starting to look and go like, well, wait. This is a, a, a beautiful martial arts. There are some sustain, sustainable properties and qualities to them. And, and there needs to be some protocol and etiquette so that it can survive. Because when it's, it's, if it's a free-for-all, it doesn't really survive. There are few good guys in the world, and the rest are, no, like, irrelevant. And so... <clears throat> I think that some of that stuff started to, co to come into play. And <clears throat> like I said in the seminar earlier, like I feel grateful that I have a strong karate pedigree and how it like helped formulate my perspective on, on how to have a jujitsu environment or how to to run a jujitsu class. I see them as one and the same. I teach them very, very similarly. Mm. Um, that being said, I fell into, you know, that jujitsu kind of world, hook, line, and sinker when I was younger. It took a lot for me to come out of it. And I hope, I hope that people can really see that they're they're not mutually exclusive you know they're they're they're, they're martial arts right i don't call jujitsu a sport god bless john danaher for doing that i don't do that i've never done that it's a martial art do you think is there is there other aspects of it's, it could be karate, it could be jujitsu, or just the martial arts as a whole that you'd like to see evolve. And I'm assuming there's a lot of aspects you'd like to remain the same, like those traditional values. But where would you like to see it kind of progress moving forward? You know, I have a deep concern that karate will be lost. And so I, when I teach the karate class, I tell the students that you are the next rung on the ladder that carries karate into the future. I know, I know. It's a big responsibility. Yeah, it's a responsibility. And that's the beauty of the whole darn thing, if you ask me. And, <clears throat> you know, what are they bringing to the conversation? Bill, what are you, rhetorically, right? What are you bringing to the conversation of karate, weiji ru karate? for the next 10 to 20 or 30 or 40 years that you are in this position. So first you gotta accept that you're, you're part of the thing that is lifting the art into the next generation. And then what is going to be your contribution to that? And that's what I'd like to see evolve. Mm. 
is that people who are practicing, whether they consider themselves an athlete or practitioner or I don't I would never use the word hobbyist. I think it's an insult. That's my own personal view, but if you consider yourself a hobbyist, I don't know what people think. That you you consider your role in the evolution of the martial arts and what will be your contribution, your sustained contribution. And because if that doesn't happen, I believe there is no evolution. I, Dana White comes across my feed. Mm -hmm. I never hear that guy talk about the importance of the martial arts. And that's what he does all day. Well, you know, like, he certainly made a billion dollars off of it, you know, and, and the shareholder. I'm not jealous of that. Congratulations, more power to you. But, like, those guys, Gordon Ryan, I love him. I know him, or I, I've, you know, I've practiced. Like, all those guys are controlling the discourse. And there's no mention of martial arts. So how is it going to evolve if there's no one considering the martial arts and its evolution and their role in it? That's my thought. Right. So that's how I would like to see it evolve. So it's kind of backsliding into just the fighting and show of it versus the... And, and, and certainly, like, you know, I... Look, I'm going to be totally transparent. I fell into that right. as a younger man. It's okay. It's a phase that many people go through. I think we ha a lot of us have to. We have to prove something. Mm -hmm. It's part of it, I guess. It was certainly part of my journey. So I can't really poo-poo another guy's journey for doing the same thing. Though I will say, where does that leave us all? If that's all we're aiming for, Last year I came up and Sensei Durkin, he was teaching a class. He says, eyes, breath, posture. And I've been thinking about that for a year, man. I, 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 I tell the students the same thing. I, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. Like, what's embedded in that? Well, there's just so many important points there. That can't be lost. No. Certainly not. Like we talked about before, that's something, the, the, the martial, the fighting side of it, and it also applies outside the dojo in life. Getting someone just to stand up a little taller, whether it's just because they're confident or they're aware of their positioning. I mean, being able to look someone in the eyes. One of the biggest challenges of my life when I was uh, about 18 years old I was having a conversation like this with Mr. Dirk, and he's got, you, you've talked to him, he's got that, he's not, trying to, he's not trying to be intimidating, but he'll just, he'll just stare at you. He's got n yes. about that much for BS, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and I just was like, you know what? Every day I talk to him, I was like, I'm just going to see how long I can hold that gaze. Because again, he's not trying to, he's not yeah. trying to push you aside. He's trying to just hone in on what you're saying. Like, I'm just going to look at him until I can hold this and just talk to him nice. eyes and... It was tough, but I got there. You know, even as a kid or a young person, that could be your contribution to the martial arts. Mm -hmm. You know, that could be your, this is what I have to say about the martial arts. I'm going to hold my head a little bit higher. This is my contribution to it. This is how I'm carrying those lessons. You don't, you don't got to be 40 or 50 or 60 years old. To, you could be 8 or 10. Yeah. You know, Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you, please. I'm, I got this test that I have to study for. I'm going to, I don't feel, I feel vulnerable. I don't feel confident on the subject. I'm having trouble, but I'm going to do my best anyway. That's a martial arts statement. That's your, your, your ability to carry the conversation into the future in a way that helps preserve 
what I think the whole thing was designed for. Mr. Durkin says something that I think holds true to what you're saying is imagine if everyone in the world did martial arts. Martial arts, like what you're talking about, those life value aspects of like how much better would everyone's life be? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, look, I didn't always put a high value on it. Unfortunately, I, 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 I had to make a lot of mistakes though I certainly do now. I certainly understand better. Mm. And, you know, we, like, I taught the seminar, right? And I, we got there early, and I sought you out, and I was like, Bill, help me with the kata. I want to warm up with the kata. I want to immerse myself in these ideas And <clears throat> I think that that's in, it's just important. It's beautiful. It's a gift. It's a, and, and then, you know, it contributed, it contributed to the way I was able to communicate. You know, it, it, it informed me in my career, really, you know? It's like I, I, I was able to relate to people differently. Mm. A li I believe a little bit more effectively, a little bit higher. And all because we did the kata, we did it twice or three times. We did it twice. Twice. Yeah, twice. You, you're an outstanding teacher, by the way. I've had some very good teachers help yeah. me along the way. <laughs> right answer, pal. <laughs> <laughs> right answer. That's a martial art answer. Um, but yeah. It's all about connecting with people, seeing something from someone else's point of view. It's how we avoid confrontation too, and that's something as a martial artist we should try to, I think at least, um, train ourselves to, instead of just fighting someone on a point, maybe try to get their point of view first and then see where you connect as, as humans. And then maybe, you may not agree on everything, but at least you see where you're coming from so you don't have to you know, pound fist or just yell at yeah. each other. That's what I try to do, at least. You know, my, my, it reminds me, my friend Thomas Clifford, I remember him saying years ago that he, he felt that the, one of the very best martial arts books ever written was not a martial arts book. It was The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People by Stephen Covey. And in that book, I understand that Covey discusses the importance of seek to understand first and then to be understood. And I think that that's exactly what you're saying. You know, if we understand people a little bit before we talk, then we typically avoid contact, uh, conflict. We're, t we're, we, we, we're, we're in a natural flow. And I love that. I think yeah. that that's a great lesson to be teaching and expressing. Seek to understand first and then to be understood. It's mm -hmm. powerful. Not always easy. <laughs> <laughs> so just uh, on a diff different subject, maybe we'll just do a couple more questions. Sure. There's only a couple left. But I really do want to talk about um, you're an accomplished artist. Mm. I've seen some of your work. It's outstanding. Thank you. And I want to. I want to really. I want to. I want to hear if you find that your art practice and your martial arts practice have any connectivity with each other. Do they relate to each other in any way? They're one and the same. You know, one of the things that I think I can. I had to contend with in that transition that I talked about earlier from out of the competition phase and into the martial arts phase was <clears throat> this, this question or this point of who and what am I doing this for? Who and what am I doing this practice for? And it's a question that I keep in the forefront of my mind as it relates to this 
art practice that I have. And there's, there's so many different arrows that, that try to like pierce my consciousness as it relates to painting. And that like I kind of, I didn't master in my martial arts practice, but a lot of them came years ago. They're just a little bit out of my consciousness. They're like out of sight, out of mind, bit, a little bit. And, you know, who and what am I doing this for? Am I doing this for the love of something and for the, the, the manifestation of progress on my own terms? Or am I trying to impress somebody? Am I trying to chase after something that I'm never going to be, nor do I really want to be? For instance, I have the pleasure and the privilege of being a student of Max Ginsburg. Max Ginsburg is a 93-year-old painting master who has only fine-tuned his faculties with maturity. He has not lost anything. He is amazing, a force of nature. And in the very beginning of my practice with the master, and I use that term very sparingly. I don't typically use it in the martial arts. I save it for very few people. And I, 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 don't, I just don't use it in my life, really. But that guy earned it. But one of the things that I, 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 the initial traps that I fell into or had to grapple with was I want to be just like my teacher. Mm. And then I started to think, well, wait a second here. There's already a Max Ginsburg. And I'd rather be the best Gene Dunn rather than a second-rate Max Ginsburg. Or even a third or fourth rate. I don't think I can get close to the guy. It's just, we, we, went, we went to the, Met, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, right? And... I'm wheeling a, he, he, it's a, it's, it's a big day for him. So he likes to have a wheelchair. He's not wheelchair bound, but sometimes he wants to rest. Right. So I'm pushing the master around in this wheelchair. And we, he's like, I want to see Rembrandt. And he starts talking about the way Rembrandt was painting the light. And he had some criticism. And if it was any other person on walking the planet Earth today, I would have looked at him and said, you're out of your mind. Like, you don't know, you're talking about the, one of the greatest painters to ever live. But this guy earned that right. And I was like, I kept my mouth shut. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And... So I don't leak. Why did I bring that up? Because how am I ever going to be just like him? I can't. And it's an example of one of the traps that I think we fall into, both as martial arts students, as, as art students, anything like when we have a teacher or like. And so <clears throat> I believe they're one and the same. I'm lucky or blessed enough to have had all of these lessons that I, that I learned in the martial arts, daily practice, daily discipline, daily focus, like cultivate oneself in the practice. And I just apply that. Like the canvas might as well be the kata. The canvas might as well be the way I tie my belt or the way I brush my teeth or wh however it is. So I think they're just, they're exactly the same. They're no different. That's beautiful. I really relate to the, the, you comparing, trying not to compare yourself. You're not trying to become your teacher. As an, uh, as an early young instructor, 
I, I don't know if you went to the same thing. Of course I did. Yeah. <laughs> I even tried on a Japanese accent. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go that far. <laughs> but yeah, you know, Mr. Dirk and Mr. Tran, the other scenes of the dojo, I caught myself talking like them, like, that's not my voice. So my teaching career has been trying to take parts that apply to me and how I communicate and make it my own. And I can really relate to that. You know, certainly one of the first phases of learning is modeling. Right. Right, that's not, but we, I think a lot of us fall into a myriad of different traps. Mm. And that's an easy one to kind of just point to and go, oh, I had that in the martial arts. I already overcame that one. Let me not, let me not get too deep in that hole. And there are all kinds of like, you know, other variants of challenges, you know, that, that parallel. It, it could be said the same thing if you're a parent raising your kid. Yeah. You know, you're, it's the same practice. Some days you got more patience than others. Some days you're a little bit, you know, more energetic than others. Like, and you've got to manage it. You've got to come to the practice and keep, like Josephine said, keep putting one foot in front of the next. Keep marching forward. I always laugh at myself when I catch myself talking or, dare I say on camera, swearing like my father. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hopefully none of my younger students watch this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. You, it's... Be patient with Sensei, everybody. <laughs> He's working it out. Very, very good students, <laughs> thankfully. It's, it's, uh, they have a good teacher, Bill. Oh, no, 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 no. Thank you. Well, um, I, think I, just, I think we'll close with one final question. Sure. Um, there's so many I could, I could talk to you for hours. Oh, thanks. I'm taking a lot in myself here, and I hope everyone who's watching the video and, or listening to the recording does too. But do you have any other advice you'd like to share for martial arts students, whether they be young, old, uh, beginner students, or advanced students? Other advice. Or one most important advice that you can give them. One more important takeaway. You know, if I had to say anything at this moment, I understand that karate translates, or one translation is empty hand. And growing up, I... I understood, or I thought I understood, that empty hand means without a weapon. And I always thought karate was this. And then I, through the practice, I understood that, like, <clears throat> The older styles of karate, they didn't have a closed hand. That most of the techniques were open hand because they were more dangerous. And then, you know, I started to ponder that. I started to think, well, what else is an open hand capable of doing? And I started to realize that like my open hand gets to reach out to your open hand and shake it. And we get to be friends, brothers, classmates. And, and I just love that. And I think that that's the advice that I would want to share if I had advice or better yet, an idea. I don't think I'm the architect of it, but architect of it. Keep in mind what the real meaning of an empty hand is. Mm -hmm. Or the real meaning, a meaning, a potential meaning for an empty hand. It's like all of these things that we're doing, I would hope, culminates into bringing us together more rather than separating us. I couldn't agree more. 
Thank Shihan, you. Shihan, thank you. Love it's you. a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure.